Please turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8, and tonight we'll look at verses 12 and 13. Revelation 8, 12 and 13 on the fourth trumpet. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Talking about ominous, those words certainly conjure up something scary. What we find when the fourth trumpet sounds is the visible church at large in a completely fallen state. A third of the sun, moon, and stars were struck, resulting in darkness. We know from our study of the Revelation so far that these heavenly bodies represent the Word of God in some form. We understand that the sun represents the New Testament. The moon represents the Old Testament and stars are the ministry sent to guide the church with the light of God's Word. At about 600 AD, apostasy had become so ingrained in the visible church and ritual had been substituted for the experience of salvation. So within the limits of the visible church at large, there was nothing but darkness. However, Notice that the darkness was not total. Only thirds had been affected. From this we see God's judgment on the apostasy that has taken down a portion of the church that professes to be the church of God. Matthew Henry makes five significant points on this darkness. Number one, where the gospel comes to a people and is but coldly received and has not its proper effects upon their hearts and lives, it is usually followed with dreadful judgments. Two, God gives warning to men of his judgments before he sends them. He sounds an alarm by the written word, by ministers, by men's own consciences, and by the signs of the times so that if a people be surprised, it is their own fault. Three, the anger of God against a people makes dreadful work among them. It embitters all their comforts and makes even life itself bitter and burdensome. Four, God does not in this world stir up all his wrath, but sets bounds to the most terrible judgments. And five, corruptions of doctrine and worship in the churches are themselves great judgments, and the usual causes and tokens of other judgments coming on a people. Apostasy is not a good thing. Kind of what uh, Dr. Henry is saying here, that when the church starts on this slope, it's a slippery slope, because they are defying God in departing from the truth. And God gives them ample warning over and over and over and over again, until they just will not hear God, and the destruction comes upon them. And he points out that the destruction may not be persecutions and things of that nature. The persecution is actually the corrupt doctrines that they embrace, that convince themselves that they are Christian, but their doctrines are anything but Christian. So God looks not just at the moment, at the time of the fourth trumpet. God is looking back over almost six centuries of the gospel during which time he has constantly given warning and alarm as the zeal for truth and righteousness was declining. Now that the visible church at large has gone into total apostasy, uh, 
the anger of God is loosed, causing a situation where God says, you do not want the truth, so I'm taking it away from you. Without the light of God's word, corruptions of doctrine and worship become entrenched to such a degree that they can never be taken away. However, as Dr. Henry points out, God does set bounds even on the most terrible judgments. You see what we saw under the sounding of the trumpet, only one third of the light goes out, meaning that there still is light. Without going into detail, the light that remained was seen in such men as John Wycliffe and John Huss. Albert Barnes in his commentary helps us with this comment. He wrote, it is not as if the sun, the moon, and the stars were entirely blotted out, for there was still some remaining light. That is, there was a continuance of the existing state of things, as if these heavenly bodies should still give an obscure and partial light. And listen to this insight. Perhaps it is also intended by the symbol that there would be light again. The world was not to go into a state of total and permanent night. That's some perception on the part of this man. So now looking back at the fourth seal, we saw this apostate church represented by a pale horse whose rider is death. The horse was the collar of death and its rider was the personification of death. We will also recall that in the letter to the church at Thyatira, that this rider was also given the name of Jezebel. Death follows this dead church at large. And it was said of Jezebel that she, that is the leaders of the apostate church, causes her followers to commit adultery with her and descend to the depths of Satan. This Jezebel, this rider of this death horse, represents the papacy that arose to take the vast majority of the visible church at large out from under the rule of Christ. While the Roman church claims a lineage of popes intact from the person of Apostle Peter, this is essentially fiction. It's not true and it cannot actually be proven. In reality, the total power of the Bishop of Rome over the church at large began with Gregory the Great in 590 AD. And it is said that Gregory was last of the church fathers and the first of the medieval popes. Nothing really good said in that statement. The fourth trumpet says that because of the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars, a third part of the day and night did not shine. When the church abandons the truth of God's word, severe consequences happened to the integrity of that church. Without sufficient light, the most trivial things become mountains that become dividing points. The Roman church and the Greek church, both in the same darkness at this time in history, found a point of doctrine over which to divide and further destroy the influence of Christianity during the Middle Ages. The Roman church, said that the Holy Spirit descends from both the Father and the Son. Whereas the Greek church said that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father. Just think about that. They're having this big argument over how does the Holy Spirit descend on mankind? Well, in 606 AD, the division between the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church took place over this very issue. And both of these churches 
anathematized each other as heretics. Now, if we use the figure of a 24-hour day to mean the Middle Ages, which we're talking about, we can see that the Roman church could possibly be the day, and the Greek church could possibly be the night, or turn them around, so that both of them are actually apostate, and they did not shine during the entire day of the Middle Ages. So this day that was darkened is the period of the Middle Ages, and that darkness is seen in both the Roman church and the Greek church. While the visible church at large was totally apostate, there was still some light of God's word that was in fact shining. During the medieval age, several separatist and independent groups emerged, such as, but not limited to, the Cathari, the Beguines, and the Waldens. Waldenses, excuse me. Those first two, maybe you're not so familiar with, but the Waldensians, I'm sure most people have heard of them. These were populations in Europe that rebelled against the authority of the Pope and the corruption of the bishops and the priests. These groups had views on the gospel that reached back to a purer church, although in some cases there were some unique and even heretical understanding of the doctrine and practice. However, even with maybe some of those oddities, they were far closer to the truth of God's word than was the apostate church. And for this, they were sorely persecuted. Some of these groups actually began translating the Bible from the Latin into their native language. They were that far advanced of the apostate church. Now the Jezebel nature of the papacy and its priesthood is said to seduce people to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The Roman church had far more influence in Europe and expanded its influence much farther than did the Orthodox Church. While both have their Jezebel elements, those elements are more obvious and pervasive in the Roman Church. The sexual immorality attributed to this Jezebel ministry in the letter to Thyatira represents the spiritual corruption of the apostate church. In the Gospels, Jesus taught that sexual immorality violates and breaks the marriage bond. Matthew 19, verse 9. The church is the bride of Christ. A false gospel has the same effect on the bond between Christ and the church as adultery has on a marriage. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, the apostle wrote, I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to Christ to present you as a pure bride to her one husband. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you submit to it readily enough. Jesus is the legal head of his church, and he is the husband of his bride, the church. Fornication occurred when the Bishop of Rome was declared the universal Pope, the Vicar of Christ, and he effectively took the visible church away from its true husband, Jesus Christ. Philip Schaff writes on the morals of the clergy at this time. 
clerical immorality reached the lowest depth in the 10th and 11th centuries when Rome was a sink of iniquity and the popes themselves set the worst example. That's a direct quote from his History of the Christian Church. The gospel had become completely lost in the ministry of the church and it was replaced by five things. It was replaced by the mass as the repetition of the sacrifice of Christ for sins of both the living and the dead. The sermon became not the preaching of the Word of God, but the reading of writings of the church fathers. And even this was often neglected. Schaff comments on the quality of the preaching of the time. He says, the great majority of priests were too ignorant to prepare a sermon and barely understood the Latin liturgical forms. What a terrible thing to foist on that which professes to be the bride of Christ. Third, the seven sacraments were looked at the actual looked as at the actual grace of God bestowed on people. And if you don't know what those are, the seven sacraments, according to the Church of Rome, are baptism, the Eucharist or the Mass, confirmation or joining the church, penance, marriage, ordination, and extreme unction. In order to not go too far into purgatory when you die, you have to have a priest standing over you when you're dying, sprinkling you with water, making signs of the cross, and saying intelligible words in Latin that he probably doesn't even understand. Then there was the worship of saints. You know, in the early church, the martyrs were highly respected. And they were looked upon with great reverence. And I use that in a low term, not in a worshipful thought. But in time, as the church apostatized, the martyrs were lifted up to sainthood and it was believed that they had a superabundance of grace. You know, if, if you have to have 100% 100, 100 grace to go to heaven, the martyrs had 250%, 300%. And the, the church believed this, that anything over 100% of each of the saints went into a bank and was available for people on earth to be able to use because, you know, we only had 15% grace. And so we could call upon a saint, go light a candle, worship a relic, and somehow that grace was applied to us so that from 15% we were now 16%. You know, the Pope didn't want anybody living to think they had 100%. They had that kind of control over people. So the saints were actually worshipped. And finally, the worship of images, statues, and also relics, pieces of bone that were said to be the finger of somebody. Or, uh, you know, some churches have pieces of the wood from the cross of Jesus. And it seems to me that if you took all these pieces of wood and put them together, you'd have more wood than it takes to make one cross. No, no truth in these relics. But yet, people were convinced that somehow when they would worship an image of the Virgin Mary or, or the Apostle John or something like that, or that you would actually kiss part of a garment that supposedly was worn by Jesus, you were given more grace. Apostasy is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And it brings people into a greater darkness. Very hard to call Catholics out of Catholicism to the gospel because they rely so much on these things as their ticket to heaven. 
During this time, the visible church ceased to be Christian and became pagan, draped in the rags of nominal Christian trappings. The sun, the moon, the stars were darkened. No light shined in the day and the night. No light shined in the Roman church and the Orthodox church during this medieval time. It, it is tragic that without the light of God's word, people just become religious and do not realize the salvation that God makes possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we cannot say that no one was saved during the Middle Ages. There were saved people. I mentioned some of them earlier. But real salvation was scarce. There are notable examples of people that were truly born again, but for the most part, they were persecuted and put to death. As dark a picture that is sounded by the fourth trumpet, its final notes give hope to God's people during this time. In verse 13, it says, And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Who, are, who is this angel? Keep in mind the angels of the church, the stars, were not shining. But now those stars that are not shining are challenged by an angel that cries out to the church. This angel obviously represents a reformation that was percolating within the corruption of the visible church. This angel that shouts the woe, 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 represents men such as John Wycliffe and John Huss, who translated the Bible into their native languages and preached and wrote tracts and books on the real gospel. They died before the actual Reformation, but their work stirred people and prepared them for the Reformation that did come. John Huss died about a hundred years before Martin Luther, but yet he had a profound impact on Martin Luther and was one of the reasons that Luther was emboldened to take that 95 thesis and tack it up on the church door and start the Protestant Reformation. Their work is described as woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the world. These remaining blasts of the next three angels will expose this earthly church and call out God's people to the true gospel of salvation from sin. Remember the trumpets tell us why. Why did a church built by Jesus with the promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it fall so deeply into apostasy from which it would never recover? This trumpet kind of looks back over the whole gospel age of about 600 years up to this point. The first trumpet reminded us that the success of the conquering church is commitment to follow its head and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost. Remember, that church went out conquering and a conquering. So what happened here by the sounding of the fourth trumpet? Well, the church, the visible church at large, quit following its head, Jesus Christ, and followed someone else. The second trumpet warned us of the danger of success in the battle against error. We will always be fighting error, and God will raise up people that will be successful in battling error. 
But listen, we should never become so lifted up and proud of ourselves because we comprehend sound doctrine and can uh, skillfully defeat those that are putting forth false doctrine. We don't want to do that because we can become too confident in our religious and church abilities and then start following ourselves instead of Christ. During this time, they began to see themselves as the only ones who were right. Has that ever happened since then in history? You better believe it has happened. And when you see a group, a denomination, a fellowship, saying, look, we're the only ones that are right, beware. Beware. The second trumpet is sounding. Don't go around those people. The third trumpet warns us not to change the gospel message of salvation from sin and a holy life. Don't change it. When people do not hear of repentance and faith in Christ, they become bitter because they have religion without salvation. And the fourth trumpet warns us against a ministry with no light of the gospel. Such a ministry marries people to a false Christ and leads them into idolatry and spiritual fornication. But we also see that Jesus Christ works against apostasy. And in time, he restores the true bride of Christ, his church. So even in this last time, of the seventh seal in which we are living with all the spiritual corruption that surrounds us. We have the hope that Christ will again restore the visible bride of Christ and to prepare us for his second coming. Amen.